our mission is to reach people, to make disciples of all nations, right? To take the word of God to the end of the earth, reach the lost. And we have to separate in some ways because our mission has not changed. But the way that we're reaching people and our methods have changed. And I, I feel like the church of the future is the one who is going to be more in love with their mission than they are with their methods. Frank here with another episode of Modern Church Leader. Excited to talk to Nathan Art today. Nathan, thanks for joining the show. Oh, Frank, thank you so much for being here. I'm excited. Where Where are you actually at? Where are you physically located? Uh, in the ATL, man. I'm actually in the oh. city of Atlanta. Yes, sir. Are you Are you like downtown Atlanta? I am. Yeah. There's a little area called uh, Emmon Park, Cabbage Town. So if you're from uh, Atlanta, you know where that is by the Beltline. Uh, to be I mean, I, I've kids. been there enough to kind of know. I don't know it super well, but you know, <laughs> I have a general idea. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's a good spot. It's a fun place to live. It is a great place to live. The kids love it. And it's my way of tricking myself into thinking I'm younger than I am. So it's great. How, how many? Yeah. Living downtown, like living <laughs> in the city kind of thing. That I don't yeah. know how you do. Like, I don't know. I, I like being in the city. I've never lived in the city. And with kids and space and all the things that oh, yeah. we definitely enjoy. Yeah. I could see, I don't know. Is that challenging? There's lots of parks. So I like literally okay. live next door. Atlanta is actually known. Uh, well, people kind of know it for its traffic, but if you live in the city, you don't really deal with the traffic. But uh, right. uh, the other thing Atlanta is known for is parks. So I mean, we literally live within walking distance of three different parks. And so it's kind of nice. You can just get out and, and do your thing, but you can't go outside like the entire summer because it's too humid. No, it's way too hot. You throw them in the pool. Man. You just take them to the community <laughs> pool and just throw them in and, and go read a book. That's kind of how it works. <laughs> yeah. Like I grew up in Vegas, which is Oof. is also very hot, right? So it's a different yeah. kind of hot, but it's also very hot. And yeah, I guess when you're a kid, you don't really care. But when you're an adult, you're like, this is hot. I can't hang out outside. 100%. Yeah, 100%. And, uh, the, and the mosquitoes. Yeah. So too good. good. Too good. Well, man, you this is going to be a fun conversation. I mean, there's lots of connection between what you guys are doing at Ministry Solutions and this stuff you've been studying, the eBooks that you've written and just what Tithely works on, right? Helping churches yeah. digitally. Um, yes. So should be fun. And I think it'll apply to basically every church on the planet. So uh, excited. Why, why don't you start off with like a little bit about yourself and how you got into, you know, ministry, like doing ministry, ministry solutions, the work you guys do yeah. there, but how you, you know, what's your story? How'd you get into the church work? Well, and what's interesting, and one of the reasons I'm just so passionate about this subject is that my pathway to the church was through the digital platform. I uh, have a mentor for years who's a believer and, and just modeled so much of um, what I wanted in my life, his marriage and the way that he treated people and just uh, his over, just his integrity. But I had zero interest in church and he brought it up a lot and, and invited me all the time. And just, I, Don, I'm not a church person. Uh, I did not identify. So you didn't grow up. You didn't grow up going to church or oh, no. no connectivity there or anything? Uh, none at all. None at all. If anything, it was more bad experiences that that, uh, that got me there. But he introduced me um, to Andy Stanley through a DVD series. I watched the thing. I said, man, this guy is not actually crazy. He's not asking me for money. I, I kind of like some of the things he's saying. And I was curious. And that's something that I think we uh, need to create and foster more of is curiosity. But got into what I now know as a small group. Didn't know it then. Uh, became a Christian and then uh, started attending Buckhead Church. And um, kind of in that, my, my background was in private equity and, and commercial real estate development, started working with the, some North Point churches. And I accidentally started a business that uh, last this past year, we just crossed over a billion dollars worth of churches that we have managed and funded. But in that time too, just working with um, a lot of the larger innovative churches started growing a network for executive pastors where we were introducing the business community to groups of executive pastors and just trying to learn uh, how we can be more effective in reaching the people that um, that uh, may not come to our buildings. And so the past couple of years, we launched Executive Leadership Solutions and been doing a lot of that work, which is where uh, kind of this target resource comes from. Yeah. And is Ministry Solutions and Executive Leadership Resources the same thing, like within the same company or is it two different things that you guys are doing or how, what's the connection there? Yeah, two two different companies. So the the genesis of this was that as we were uh, focusing on multi-site strategy, we do a lot of mixed use projects, which we'll talk about in the target 
study, which is how do we create buildings that are as relevant as they are reverent. Um, we just started working with a lot of executive pastors who were looking for tools and resources outside of the buildings. Um, and so we actually launched a separate company just strategically focused on um, equipping executive leaders for the church of the future. And that was putting them in rooms with each other and the best thought leaders we could find in the business world. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And I, I don't, I mean, I, I know Andy, he's actually been on the show, which is kind of fun. Um, awesome. I don't know him yeah. like super, super well, yeah. uh, but man, he is, he a smart dude. So I, his, his right connect. Yeah. Like his, um, you know, he's a pastor and does ministry, but his business, uh, thinking is also pretty awesome. So just, you know, he's kind of crosses over. <laughs> he Well, he's just a leader, right? And yeah. one, one of the things in the church, I feel like com coming from the business world and not being a Christian, that's interesting is we almost separate those two areas of life. But, you know, honestly, so much of it is in human uh, behavior and just the way that people think and feel and his his leadership and, and a lot of these resources cross over because at the end of the day, what we're trying to effectively do is engage people and lead people. Uh, and, and those there, there's, there's a lot of commonalities between those two, yeah. those two arenas, you know? So yeah, yeah. he is the best. There's no question. He's had yeah. a tremendous impact on my life. Totally. totally. Lots of people. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I think this topic, right? Like, especially because of COVID and it feels weird even kind of using that framing because it's like three years old almost, it feels like, um, but you know, because of COVID every church on the planet was forced to go digital. And prior to that, you know, you had lots of churches like in America, there's 300 plus thousand churches and you had lots of them that had no digital presence, didn't think about online anything, yep. didn't, didn't care to right? It, and, and it was okay, maybe at that point, yeah. but COVID kind of forced everyone to go figure at least something out, right? So every church had to go get a website, learn how to stream something, maybe get an app, get online giving, like they had to do all these things. And then they had to go figure out how do I, for like at least a solid year, how do I connect with people even more so online than I could in person? And that's so right. They were trying to figure that out. Like they were forced into it mm -hmm. and man, that's a hard way to kind of have to go figure it out. But I think the church, you know, got better because of it, but still is still in this mode of figuring out what what you know you hear people talking about like hybrid church and church in person and church online and how do you mix the two together well and so i think it's a struggle like i think there's a lot like the really big guys i feel like have a, a leg up because they have the resources and the staff and the people that are thinking about it but not that they've all got it perfect but they at least have the yeah. ability to go there first but your average church is 100 200 members and they're trying to figure this stuff out and it's pretty difficult so I, I all that's just a little primer on i think the research you've done and what's it called target corp and the flexible church so right. that ebook people should go download it and we're going to talk about it but <laughs> i think it's fascinating like i think it's such a fascinating set of like research that you did to to kind of connect some dots for the church so let's let's jump yeah. in yeah, and I, and I think something you said, Frank, that is really important, though, is um, what COVID did, it, you know, COVID did not change really anything. What it did was it took 20 years of change that was already in place and it condensed it into a two to three year period. And so the way that people were engaging with companies and with churches and uh, really in just their everyday life, those changes were already taking place and we just were kind of hanging on it. It just what COVID did was force us almost to face the new reality of what people are looking for and how they uh, how they interact with um, with church and yeah. and other areas of life and yeah yeah uh, and I mean churches and like I don't know the right kind of way to phrase it but you know even in as being a business that operates serving churches through yeah. technology we just know that churches predominantly lag way behind everything else. Yeah. Right. So like what you see happening in the for profit tech world is 10 years ahead and churches are 10 years behind that. And in churches just slow to adopt stuff. Most of them. Right. There's some that Sometimes. aren't, of course. I agree. Um, but most yeah. of them are slow. And so, yeah, COVID just condensed it all really fast. It um, did. And some it, some people figured some stuff out and some people went back to their old ways. And now we're in this kind of weird like things changed. I think every church I've ever talked to post COVID are like, things are different period. 
there's less people in the building. Attendance might be back. It might not be back. We're doing a bunch more things online. We're still struggling with how mm-hmm. to figure this whole thing out. Well, that and that is what we're here to talk about, right? Yeah. So yeah, the yeah. good the good news for us, and and uh, we had a chance to talk about this a little bit before, but the reason the reason I was excited about this resource too is um, when COVID hit and the church got just totally disrupted in their model, um, I got very curious because the digital platform and, and and digitization overall has been impacting impacting industry for twenty years now. And so you hear the stories of J.C. Penney and Sears going out of business, and you also see the companies like Target and Home Depot and others that have this meteoric rise out of irrelevancy. They, they had the same exact set of problems that the church did. We can't get people in our stores or we can't get people in our buildings, right? And we're losing relevance with the market that we're trying to reach. And so, hey, you know, what was the reason that Target and Home Depot took off and that Sears and J.C. Penney went out of business? And for me, it's not about copying and pasting a corporate model. And I know that comes up and that's like a scary thing. Like we're talking about Target and we look at their political stance. But the reality is last year they sold $83 billion of perishable goods. And I want to know, I want to know how we can leverage their experience and their learnings to reach people with the imperishable message of Jesus Christ. So that's that's the thing that we're excited about. And Target is an unbelievably relevant case study in yeah. in just that. And I mean, I, just to make sure we hit the point, right? Like JC Penney's and Sears, Target and Home Depot, all physical retail stores. You had to yep. go to the store to buy the stuff from the stores. And, you know, Sears and JC Penney, like back in the day, even when I was like young, like they were big operations. Like yeah. I don't know how big, but they, you know, they were way I, I would see way more of them than I would see a Target or a Walmart or any of that, you know, a Home Depot, right? Um, but they all died. Yeah. It's crazy, right? But you're saying like they just didn't figure out the shift to digital. Like they they just got stuck there, didn't figure it out. And eventually that goes to a zero. It goes to a zero. And and one of the things that we're probably getting way too far ahead, one of the biggest differences between the the people who made it and the people who didn't was the willingness to confront the brutal facts. Sears and JCPenney fell in love with their model more than they fell in love with their mission. And our mission is to reach people, right? Uh, to I mean, to make disciples of all nations, right? To take the, the word of God to the end of the earth, reach the, the lost. And um, we have to separate in some ways because our mission has not changed. But the way that we're reaching people and our methods have changed. And I, I feel like the church of the future is the one who is going to be more in love with their mission than they are with their methods. And that was the big differentiator between Target and Home Depot is willing to say, hey, look, what we've done for 20 years no longer works. And we have to have the courage to turn and face the brutal facts of a changing economy and a changing market um, and, and find relevance with that group of people. Sears and J.C. Penney just wanted to be relevant to that group of people. And there's a huge difference in those two things and how they mm-hmm. approach their model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean... what. And connect the dots to churches. So churches how to model, like you have Sunday service, you do it in the building, like in person was the model. You might have Wednesday night things, you might have other programs going on, youth group activities on Fridays, all the stuff, but it was all geared around being in the building, yeah, doing everything. Now there's small, there's other parts of this, so it's a little bit of a generalization, but it was in the building stuff. And, and now that COVID kind of condensed a bunch of stuff made it all very obvious that we can't just keep doing that. Well, there, there's a lot on that. I mean, honestly, you know, um, uh, we, I could, I could, we could talk about that for a long time. Like, to give you the context of why we wrote the resource on Target, here was their situation. And this is why it's so astounding to me on what we can learn as a church. So in 2014, Target stock was considered distressed. They, they were seeing fewer people in their buildings than they had in 15 years. And so that was their goal. We had to get people to our large buildings, which had become a destination away from the communities they were trying to serve. And uh, Brian Cornwall steps in and, and five years later, five years later, they went from distressed stock and closing stores to Bloomberg announcing them as the retail model of the future. And yes, that was exactly the year before COVID. Uh, Mr. Cornwall was... Uh, uh, he was nominated as Fortune's CEO of the year, and they announced, and here was the key part, they announced the opening of 500 stores. And the focus was on the digital platform. 
And it seems counterintuitive, Frank, and this is what a lot of churches are struggling with, is the idea that a focus or an adoption of a digital presence will cannibalize or take away from or commoditize our in-person experience. Now, that can be true. That can be true. If we just continue to copy and paste our Sunday morning service and, and put it online and call that a digital experience. Right, right, right. I got a camera in the back. Camera in the back. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not going to work. Stage it's and, not going to work. Right. Yeah. And, and so the focus was, all right, so first of all, why don't people shop in our stores? They wanted to truly understand why people don't shop in the store. They also knew that the existing customer needed to have a better shopping experience. So it was really twofold. It was equipping people to have a better shopping experience. And it was, it was, it was introducing themselves and, and making Target a part of everyday's, people's everyday shopping. And what they found, this focus on digital did not take away from their in-store sales. It actually drove their in-store sales. And one of the things that stood out to me in doing the research I found four brick and mortar retailers who are also in the top 10 online retailers in the country, right? So if you throw out Wayfair and Amazon and eBay, you, Home Depot, Target, Wal and I hate to say Walmart, but Walmart. Um, and what's interesting is they're all in the top 10 online retailers in the country, but not one of them, not one of them sees more than 10% of their sales online, which means, again, I just can't emphasize this enough, a focus on using the digital platform to reach new markets drove people to the store. It, it did not compete with the store. It actually created an experience that ended with uh, a tactile experience uh, on location. And so we're battling through this as a church, right? That we're trying to get people in our buildings. But here's the biggest thing in my mind in doing this research and working with a lot of churches that, that we see that has changed. And we have to ask the question, why is attendance so important? Why do we want people in our buildings so badly? And if you think about it, and I'm not saying this is the answer for every church, but the model has been that attendance is the leading indicator of engagement. If I put a thousand people in the room, I know that there's X number of giving units and X number of people serving and so many people in community groups. And what's happened through the digitization of, of society is now we actually have to focus on creating engagement to get people to attend. So attendance is not driving engagement. Now engagement is actually driving attendance. And that is the focus and the shift that Target took and other retailers have taken in order to increase their in-store sales. Right, right. Yeah, it's uh, that's fascinating. What, like, I, I don't, you know, know how deep the research goes, but like what things did Target do that started giving them like signs of life? Like, oh yeah, this digital thing's important and here's some stuff that we're doing that's, giving us that insight or showing us that it's working. So there's a lot to say on that too. One of the things that we highlight in the book is that, um, and this is, this is my opinion, so take it for what it's worth, but what Target figured out was the difference between relevance and convenience. So convenience is just taking something you may or may not want and then making it more accessible. But relevance really is giving people exactly what they're looking for at the time they need it most. Okay, so we um, Frank Blake is this was the CEO of Home Depot. He's well known for transforming brick and mortar uh, retail space with a digital platform. He was very much the the leader of that movement, and uh, he's here in Atlanta, Buckhead Church actually. So we've we've done a lot of work together. But he talked about his experience, and this is the difference when when Home Depot decided that their biggest competitor was not Lowe's, it was actually Amazon, which was a big thing. Yeah, they they decided, totally different, right? They're like, oh wait, Amazon doesn't even exist physically. Like correct. they're only digital. So now, how do I think about that? Well, they're they're only digital, and what's interesting, and we could talk about this, is that they didn't try to make Home Depot an Amazon experience. Right. They just realized, right? So they instead of digital is not a strategy, they saw digital as a tool for their strategy, and so they they named Amazon their biggest competitor, but didn't play Amazon's game. They used digital for a whole different reason, and theirs was the drive-in store experience, right? But he's, you know, as he talked about his first days in the digital engagement, he said, look, all we really did was we took our Sunday morning circular and then we put it online and we called it a digital experience. And here, here's the biggest problem with that. And this is the difference in convenience and relevance. If you think about the Sunday morning circular, right? So the company, the marketing department, they sit down and they figure out faucets, which faucets, which price points, refrigerators, right? And you get this list. But if I open yeah. that circular and I'm looking for chainsaws, 
you're not relevant to me. Right. Yeah. Right. You might have to describe what a Sunday morning circular is. <laughs> is I, like, I don't know if everybody knows what that <laughs> is. But. Well, if you remember the Sunday morning paper, right? All the advertisements you get from all the different retailers and their, their hope was they would put the right things in front of you. And it was just blasting um, out um, a shotgun strategy and they're hoping yeah. for a one to 2% conversion rate. Maybe it was seasonal at best, like seasonal yeah. and area of the country kind of thing. Yeah. Here, here's the difference that they ended up moving towards, which is we, um, you know, the, the TV, print, and radio uh, were huge advancements in our ability to communicate with people, but they're all one-way communication mediums, okay? And what's interesting about digital is it's really the first two-way uh, experience. And so what you'll find when you really study these companies and these leaders was that digital platform wasn't about you getting to know Target. It was about Target getting to know you and providing a curated, uh, relevant experience. And here, here's an example of what I mean. Like, um, And I think this is, a, so you, we mentioned I live in Atlanta. Um, we have the highest gay population in the United States. I have really good friends of the lesbian couple and, 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 and there's issues and things that they wrestle with and they know I'm a believer. And we talk about this stuff all the time. And, but they have some, 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 obviously some some opinions of the church based on their experience and i have another uh friend who really had some major anxiety issues through covid and i have another neighbor who is uh just experienced some issues in their marriage and they're navigating some things if i invited all those people to church this sunday what are the chances that the message is going to be relevant to them right it, it might be on generosity and we don't reach any of them so when we think about relevance we think about the church becoming a place where as people are struggling through whatever their specific issue is that we're able to meet them in their time of need. That's relevance. It's not come to our building, listen to a sermon, and maybe next year we'll do, you know, come to our marriage series that's in the fall. That's a year and a half away. Right now they're struggling with something. So how do we meet them in their greatest area of need with the greatest message of hope in the world? That is the move of the church towards relevance to people. And the digital platform is not the 1990s version of TV ministry. It is the biggest opportunity we have to actually get to know the people that we're trying to serve. And that's the mindset shift that we see these companies taking that I think we can learn the most from. Right, right. Yeah. How, how are, I mean, I guess shifting into you helping churches uh, in the work that you guys are doing, like how are churches hearing that message? Oh, you know, man. No, how I mean, are they responding? Kind of, yeah, that's what's kind of fun, Frank, is, you know, and nobody has an answer, but. I think one of the blessings that I have felt in my life, and I'm not sure uh, why me, but and um, we, we've had a chance to work with just uh, some of the best business and some of the best ministry leaders out there. And I wouldn't say anyone has an answer, but we're a part of this huge innovation right now and just seeing church leaders think differently about how we're engaging and reaching people. And so we have built a team of, I mean, truly just some of the best minds in ministry who have built successful ministries and they're partnering with churches and going through strategy and going through um, and, and really getting back to just what is our missional clarity and who are we trying to reach and how do we best reach them and putting, putting those questions back on the table. And so, no, we're seeing a lot of really cool things happen in the church right now. And then um, subsequently to just God has opened amazing doors with, I mean, this past couple of weeks, man, I just interviewed the president of Google and people at Target and Apple. And there's, believe it or not, there's actually Christians in corporate America. It's a crazy yeah. thing. Um, <laughs> And just in their experience and coming in and, and, and being a part also of uh, uh, doing events and other things with us that are helping these church leaders kind of think through some of those big concepts. And so right. I'm just sitting here in the middle learning uh, all of this and being a part of all this. And it's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is Are there things bubbling up? Like I'm trying to see like, are, you know, how can we help someone that's listening to this show, right? Yes, go download the ebook and, and read through that check out your guys' website, but are there things that you're seeing churches start to kind of practically do to, you know, use digital to get to know the people around them that they're serving and, and build that connectivity and that two-way connection? Like what's that, you know, what, what's shifting or what are churches starting to like try to get better at that? Well, I, I, I think, I think first, I think the biggest thing is that we are, kind of looking at digital and this opportunity almost as an additional program. The biggest mistake I would say that I see churches making is, 
oh yeah, that thing might be important. Let's take Sally, whom we've never really had a place for, but we like her. Um, and let's go throw her at it, give her no resources, no volunteers, and then let's see what she right. can do. Um, right, right. And, and that to me has been kind of the biggest thing. And we're, and we're again, seeing it as an additional program or a threat to manage versus an integrated part of our strategy. Right. Triggers are amazing at developing content. Um, I mean, they're machines, right? It's kind of like what they do. <laughs> they're, con they're content machines. I think at the base of it, I think the first thing to do is just step back and just reevaluate the first questions. I mean, I remember reading about some of the first meetings at Target. Brian Cornwell was just asking questions. He said, hey, why are our stores so big? You know, I said, well, you know, I don't know if you know this, sir, uh, but people make lists and they do all their shopping uh, one day a week. And he's like, oh, do they do they still do that? Uh, you know, why do we have, why are we 20 minutes away from the people we're trying to serve? Oh, so we can have big stores. Oh, okay. It, just begin to ask those questions. Of why are we doing these things? But getting back to just the core. And then from there, I, I would say, you know, you will go as far as your organization is aligned and budgeted for the success of this. And so looking at the resources you're willing to, to, to put towards this, um, those are fundamental things. And then if you're a church of 200, 300 people, you're like, I don't, I don't have the budget for, for, uh, most of this here, here's what I would ask of you to do is, is audit your communication and is everything you're sending out about you? I mean, I, I'm, I'm not picking on churches, but I will say this thing drives me nuts, right? Every Thursday I get blasted with emails from churches about what sermon they're preaching on Sunday, as if I didn't know that they were preaching a sermon on Sunday. There's no way for me to respond to that. There's no opportunity to ask me questions or for to respond to questions. There's no, they don't know if I'm married. They don't know anything about me, mostly because they've never asked. They've never asked. And even if they have the information, they don't do anything with it. They don't use it. And so the, the things that we have to start thinking about is, does our communication make us more, try to make us more significant to people? Or are we trying to make people more significant to us? You can look at that and audit it through the lens of social media, through email, um, through everything else. And those are the basic fundamental things that you could do today. And then from a, from a more advanced perspective, yeah, there's lots of tools and there's lots of resources that uh, we're beginning to integrate into, well, into those. Let strategies. me ask you this, every, um, cause, cause we, this is a little bit of connectivity to Tithely, but yeah, all these guys, Home Depot, Target, Walmart, obviously, obviously the digital first ones like Amazon, eBay. They all have their app and that seems to be the thing. Like even, uh, I don't know if it was Chick-fil-A or in and out or one of these, they're like, you go through the drive through and they're like, will you be ordering on your app today? Like you're in the drive through you're like at the physical place and they're asking you yeah. to like use your app to order. So like everybody in the retail or you know, fast food or whatever, like apps are like the thing. Is that a thing? Like, should churches be thinking about it that way or why? You know, because like, I, I, I'm at, we do church apps for people listening. Yeah. I'm not necessarily trying to sell it. I'm, I'm actually trying to get your perspective, having studied this stuff and what yeah. you're seeing in retail, but also how churches are starting to think about it. Is that a thing? There's some really good research on that question. And let me frame your specific Christian chicken uh, uh, company <laughs> here. Um, so we do a lot of work with the Chick-fil-A executive team. We've actually, we have an event even uh, this fall um, with, uh, with their whole executive team in some churches. And uh, what was interesting, and we've invited them because uh, the average retail, the average fast food restaurant in America grosses $700,000 a year in sales. Right. McDonald's is number two at 2.6 million in per store sales. Chick-fil-A. Chick yeah. Chick-fil-A pre COVID was $7 million per store, 10 times the average. Okay. Wow. Here's what's crazy. Everything. Now think about this as a church, everything about Chick-fil-A is about the customer experience. Really let's call it the lobby right. experience. Okay. Yeah. Which was taken off the table. And during COVID, their per store revenue went north of $10 million. Wow. 35% increase per store. Right. You know, one thing they did locally, I know it's not your point, <laughs> but I'm going to share one thing they did okay. at the local one right by my house. 
they added a second lane in the drive through They were the only yeah. ones to do it. And I'm like, why did not everybody else do this? This is a brilliant idea. Anyways. Well, there's, there's some answers to that. So some of it was they did not feel that the innovation that was required for them was in the boardroom. So one of the things that they did was they actually went to their operators and they said, here's the issue we're all trying to solve. They put some carrots out there, some incentives, and made it a competition amongst the operators to solve the problems. And so a lot of the things that you saw about using police uh, as, as uh, traffic cops, literally traffic cops, uh, widening the lanes. But the big question that they put on the operators to solve was how do we, how do we create a lobby experience in the drive through So the, the question, the answer to your question go, kind of goes to that. How do we create an excellent experience? There's a lot of research on apps and, and why do people use Target and Home Depot? Um, and it's because it's not a standalone asset. It is a part of an integrated strategy. So the way that the reason Chick-fil-A's app works so great is ease of use, right? So great customer user experience. I can find what I'm looking for when I need it most, but they're also tracking that to understand what it is you like. Like they, Chick-fil-A knows I'm down for some spicy chicken, right? Like they know that, right? Yeah, that's right. So when I log in, you know, I, the first thing I see is not nuggets. Uh, that's just, it's so they're, they're focused on getting to know you and your experience what you're looking for, and they put that up there front and foremost as the as the primary options. And the app becomes a part of just an overall integrated approach that makes me know I'm going to have a good experience at Chick-fil-A. They're not going to mess up my food. I'm going to get it quickly. Um, even if there's a long line in the drive through it'll be faster than a short line somewhere else. Um, so the team, I hope that answers your question. But the app is the app is a very successful instrument when it's not a separate standalone, almost destination asset when it's right. really a part of an integrated approach to. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I mean, I think I would tend to agree just in general, like it's, it can't just be this thing that churches have. It's got to be part of a much bigger strategy and you know, you're in person and you're online and however you're doing online, whether you have an app or just your website or social media, like you have to think about it all together, you know, and they work, yeah. they work kind of hand in hand. So yeah, um, yeah, man, this is good. We could probably keep chatting all, all day because I could keep coming up with questions because I'm interested in this stuff. But I want to be respectful of your time and the audience um, and not go on forever. Is there anything that like, I'll just leave it at this. Like, have we have we glossed over any of like the biggest learnings that yeah. like, you've been talking with churches with the things they really grab onto? Yeah, I think there's one more thing in this. And again, um, one of the things that stood out to me the, the most in... Um, in the study on Target was some comments that came from Bruce Starnes, who oversees Target's uh, digital marketing strategies. Their chief uh, uh, VP of digital strategy, something like that. But he made two comments. And the first one was, our digital strategy is rooted in the local store. And then the second thing he said that was really interesting to me, he said, what we realized is that it's not the, it's not the value of our buildings that are changing, it's the role. Buildings are still valuable. They still have a use. The question is, are we using them for their highest and best use? And that question from the guy that runs digital, which is so interesting, is why they opened 500 new or why they announced opening 500 new physical locations because of the demand for physical locations that digital created. Digital is not a threat, but we have to begin to ask ourselves the questions. What can we do in person that we cannot do online? And what can we do and who can we reach online that we cannot reach in person? But right now, the idea of recording a sermon and putting it online is no different than recording a play and calling it a movie, right? We have to think about how we use these mediums to reach the audience that is on the other side of those mediums. And secondly, stop using it as a broadcast mechanism and look to these as opportunities to actually get to know the people who are engaging with us so that we can create relevance to them. Right. Right. Well, one, I love all that. And it made me think of like, you know, clearly there's something to this whole digital and in-person physical because even Amazon now has physical stores. Like one just popped up in my neighborhood. Right. So like yeah. they crush online. But eventually they got to the point where they were like, hey, we're going to put some physical stores in place, too, because they do work together. You know, so you're getting you're yeah. getting even guys like Amazon that were all digital understanding that. So. 
Yeah. And something Frank Blake said that they learned at Home Depot was a good digital experience will always create an interest for an in-person tactile experience. Right. So just right. remember that. Yeah. Love that. Well, Nathan, this has been great, man. Where can folks go to download the ebook? Yeah. So our, our website, Executive Leadership Solutions, go to el.solutions um, and uh, yeah, download the, the target ebook. And, and it's same thing, guys. There's There's team questions in there. So we've worked in some questions for you guys to wrestle with and even some surveys. And honestly, would love to hear back from you on what's impacting you, what you're thinking through, and um, we'll give you some opportunities to do that as well. But would be very grateful to have uh, to have the opportunity to connect with you. Yeah, love it, love it. Well, we'll get it out. Everyone, go check it out. Um, if you're just googling it, it's Target Corp and the Flexible Church. I think that's right. And uh, man, this has been great. Thanks for joining us today, Nathan. And um, we'll see you online soon. Yes, sir. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate yeah, the opportunity. Definitely. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week on another episode of Modern Church Leader. See ya.